Okay, welcome everyone to the fifth IIDS webinar on politics, economics, and public policy in Nepal. I'm Avidya Tacharya, and I'll be introducing the presenter and moderator for today's talk. Today's uh, speaker is Dr. Praveen Karka. Dr. Karka is an assistant professor in the Department of Government at the University of Essex. His research is broadly on the political economy of conflict with a specific focus on peacekeeping operations and counterinsurgency and with regional field experience in the Horn of Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, the Middle East, and Nepal. A graduate of the Royal Military Academy at Sandhurst, Dr. Karka served for 14 years as a combat engineer in the Nepal Army, working in the Bomb Disposal Operations Unit during the insurgency years, as well as a UN peacekeeper in the Congo on two separate occasions in 2003 and 2008. He took voluntary retirement from the Nepal Army at the rank of major in 2009 before earning a graduate degree in international security from the Georgetown School of Foreign Service and his PhD in politics from New York University just last year. His research papers have appeared in major political science journals such as the American Journal of Political Science and International Studies Quarterly. The moderator for today's talk will be Dr. Sucheta Pyakiral. Dr. Pakiral is the director of the Center for Governance at IIDS and also teaches at the Kathmandu University uh, School of Management's Master's in Public Policy and Management program, as well as in the Master's and PhD programs of the Gender Studies Department at Trivan University. Dr. Pakiral's research focuses on democratic development and governance in South Asia, and she has published on topics ranging from ethics and government to the politics of foreign aid. Before joining IIDS, Dr. Prakaral was an assistant professor of political science and public administration at the University of North Florida. She holds a PhD in public affairs from Cleveland State University and the University of Akron, and is also a graduate of the Regional Center for Strategic Studies of South Asia. So now before Praveen starts, let me remind our participants of the ground rules. Please remember to keep your mics muted unless you're invited to speak. Uh, Dr. Karka will speak for about 40 minutes, then we will have a half-hour Q&A session moderated by Dr. Prakadal. You may send in your questions via chat or use the raise hand feature on Zoom. As always, we thank the IIDS staff, particularly Ms. Binisha Nepal, for supporting this series. Okay, Praveen, the virtual floor is yours. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Acharya. I'm uh, extremely honored uh, for this opportunity. Uh, good evening uh, from uh, Kathmandu, Nepal. Uh, I am, uh, as uh, Professor Acharya mentioned, an assistant professor at the University of Essex. And today I'm going to be presenting you uh, uh, an ongoing uh, research uh, project uh, titled Social Incentives in State and Non-State uh, Armed Groups. This is a joint work with two of my uh, dissertation committee members, Professor Michael Gilligan and Professor Cyrus Sami, both from NYU. Uh, I have tried to simplify my <clears throat> presentation today since there is so much going on because we bring in uh, evidence from three separate case studies and also because of the diversity in the audience. Uh, if there is anyone interested in reading the paper, then please feel free to email me. I'll be more than happy to email you the paper. Also, because, uh, because my substantive interest is uh, looking at social cohesion, especially in the context of international interventions, uh, in particular conflict, peace and development. If there's any intersection between what I do and between uh, what you do, then please feel free to reach out, especially because if there's any ongoing studies that you have in Nepal, which can be replicated as Professor Acharya mentioned, I work uh, in Africa mostly, so we can also you know, uh, discuss about that. But my methodological interest is in looking at social cohesion in the context of conflict and development, but using original micro-level data. I try uh, to generate original uh, field data using randomized controlled trials. I've done four RCTs uh, in Africa. I use survey experiments, mostly endorsement, uh, uh, conjoined, and list experiments. And I also do lab in the field behavioral measures. So today's paper is actually a paper that uses lab in the field behavioral measures. So I, before you know, starting my presentation, I quickly wanted to touch uh, about my research interest because as Professor Acharya mentioned, I have a little bit of a different background, uh, unlike most of the uh, academics that you know, uh, have presented here before. 
So today's paper, the primary research motivation comes from this question, how do non-state armed groups motivate troops to contribute effort? Because when resources are scarce, effort is you know, costly and dangerous. You know, it's a public good, you know, it's voluntary in the sense, you know, you don't have to contribute in terms of, you know, providing effort because there's a lot of shirking involved. Uh, the monitoring mechanism is extremely difficult and that's why it's extremely often hard to observe. So that's why this, these factors drive our research question, which is how do non-state armed groups motivate troops to contribute effort during you know, their insurgency. So our primary argument in the paper is we argue that non-state armed groups invest more in inculcation than state armed groups. Here by inculcation, we mean the definition is as follows in still an attitude, idea, or habit by persistent instruction. You know, we could have used uh, different words interchangeably, such as indoctrination, socialization. So please bear in mind that inculcation also means socialization or indoctrination. Our findings, I'll quickly, you know, immediately jump into our findings, uh, are such that, you know, we found members of uh, non-state armed groups exhibit greater sociality than members of state armed groups. And again, here, sociality means exhibiting organized association within the group, right? So what we found, which is non-state armed groups focus more on social cohesion, which in turn they believe and use to enhance intrinsic motivation amongst the you know, uh, cadres, amongst the fighters, among the insurgents. So again, this is not something new. You know, many people have talked about this. You know, there's a lot of qualitative evidence. But what we bring here is more of an empirical paper testing the same uh, hypothesis, same you know, uh, theoretical uh, framework. But we also use lab in the field behavioral measures. And we also use case studies, not only from Nepal, but from three different contexts from you know, three different continents. So that's what's unique uh, about our paper. So rebel movement, the, uh, so insurgent organization is a puzzle as Blattman and Miguel in the paper have uh, really emphasized. It is, is a, it is. Dr. Karka, you're on mute. Could you unmute yourself? Okay. How was I unmuted before, or was did this happen? Uh, just in the just, last thirty seconds. Uh, okay. Just, how uh, how, how did this happen? I, I I didn't unmute myself. I didn't mute myself. So just wanted to make that very clear. So should I should I go back to the previous slide? Yeah. Okay. So I think you. You can start talking uh, about, you know, you mentioned Blackman and Miguel, so from that, okay. that point on. Okay. Start okay. About because uh, I was mentioning that the organizational problem is indeed a puzzle in rebel movements because it requires solutions to thorny organizational problems, such as controlling free riding. You know, if you look at insurgency, then monitoring is almost impossible. You know, what an individual fighter is contributing in terms of fighting, in terms of taking risk is almost hard, almost impossible to monitor. It's also uh, an organizational problem because it, it faces this problem of over overcoming problems of credible commitment in terms of future rewards. For example, if you are in a state armed group, then you know, there's credible commitments in terms of your rewards if you win a battle. But in terms of non-state armed groups, in terms of insurgencies, there's hardly any credible reward. There's hardly any credible commitment in terms of what you're going to get in case you win the battle, in case, you know, the movement sees tomorrow. So that's why the glue that holds any rebel movement is actually, and indeed, uh, 
a theoretical problem and also it, it has generated a lot of interest from the policy world. So there's some solutions proposed in the literature. So you can offer immediate material incentives such as Collier, Lickback, Weinstein have all argued, but then this may undermine strategic foundations of insurgency because the whole insurgency, the idea of any insurgency is to focus, is its focus on the population and resources may be also limited. You could also, as Beber and Blackman, Humphreys and Weinstein have argued, use coercion. But then using coercion again is again strategic goal of any insurgent organization. Another possibility which research in behavioral economics has shown is that pro-social norms can resolve various organizational problems, right? So what we mean by pro-social norms here is norms which include altruistic giving or you know, reciprocity, reci reciprocity, sorry. If someone is giving to me, then I in turn give you know, back. This, as uh, many as literature in looking at this uh, has argued, resolves the free riding problem. This also resolves commitment problem. The logic, this logic is actually consistent with classic and newer work in military sociology, such as, you know, originally stipulated by Schills and Janowitz and currently by Costa and Kahn. So based on this, our basic proposition our paper argues that where alternative material or coercive strategies cannot be used, insurgent organization requires cultivation of pro-social norms within the organization. This is our basic you know, uh, argument. So we've modeled this process and in the paper we've explained this in detail, but I want to explain this you know, in, in its most simplistic uh, terms. Let's say there's decisions to participate and it requires positive, and you know, any decision to participate requires positive expected net benefits. The net benefits depend on both pro social and material motivations. They are substitutes. We're not arguing that one is better than the other. Pro social motivations include innate sociality, network benefits, and socialization effects. But in non state armed groups, inculcation or indoctrination or socialization within organization directly enhances level of pro-sociality that is otherwise displaced which which means it's a substitution of material motivations again you know what we want to make it very clear here is over time the role of these motivations is interchangeable it might change and if there's an increase in net material benefits then you know this might substitute out in fact, you know, pro-social motivation. So we're not arguing that one is you know, important than the other. What we're arguing is in its initial phase in, in, in non-state armed groups, inculcation is key in order to motivate fighters to pick up arms. That substitute material motivations. And again, let's make it very clear, this is something not new. What we have brought here is this test using behavioral measures across three case studies. Uh, I've already touched upon this, but then very briefly, uh, the reason why we think this is happening is because uh, this has been argued by literature, especially military sociology before. And again, inculcation here means in, you know, this instill of an attitude, idea, or habit by persistent instruction. And this in turn uh, creates this feeling, this, this feeling of guilt for shirking and pride for contributing, right? So if you guilt, if you, if you if you shirk, then you know there's this guilt feeling, and instead you have this feeling to contribute, which in terms give this gives you this warm glow utility. The the important point here that we want to make is that inculcation increases intrinsic social in incentives for soldiers to contribute to the group and refrain from shirking. That's why when I started this presentation about uh, before, right, right at the front, I argued that the primary motivation of our paper here is to find, is to look at what that glue, what is that glue that holds these organizations together. Uh, we, 
Uh, this is in the paper in detail, but we believe that uh, non-state armed groups heavily invest more in inculcation for two primary reasons. The first reason is because they have to rely more on immediate social incentives because their promises for future rewards are less credible than those of state armed groups. And we can, we've clearly seen that, especially in uh, the current context of the Mao's movement in Nepal. The second is non-state armed groups often obtain lower returns from technical military training because they lack sophisticated training plus sophisticated weapon. So our hypothesis, imagine that there are two soldiers, I and J, with lengths uh, of service, let's say T. So if I, soldier I, joined beforehand or after, then the sociality of soldier I who joined later is much less than soldier J. But then our primary hypothesis is in non-state armed groups, this sociality is much higher, despite keeping the time served constant across both groups, keeping it same, the sociality in non-state armed groups is higher than sociality in state armed groups. That's our hypothesis. And we, this is what we test empirically. So in our paper, the dependent variable is, there are two behavioral games we conduct in a lab in the field setting. The games that we conduct are, the first game is pay it forward. We name it as pay it forward game and I'll explain it. I'll explain in detail how the game was conducted. The second game is a standard public goods game. That's our dependent variable. The independent variable here is years served in either a non-state armed group or a state armed group, you know, a proper professional military or an insurgent or a militia organization. And we use a variety of controls pre-war and plus post-war, such as experiences in the war. So I really want you know, the audience to remember that this is a very simple, simple empirical test, right? nothing fancy. I'd like to briefly mention the two behavioral games here. And the first one is what we call paid forward game. So in each game, there's 12 players in one group. Uh, for example, in the Maoist context, we uh, played 17 to 18 games. So each game had 12 Maoist uh, uh, fighters. So the first activity, which is known as paid forward game, you are randomly paired, three, three players are randomly paired with each other. And all this is anonymous. So for example, if you know I, Professor Acharya, and Professor Bora we could be paired randomly, but you know, we'll not know that we've been paired with each other. If whatever I contribute to Professor Acharya, who is soldier K, will not know that I, you know, I have contributed that amount to him. And whatever he contributes doesn't come back to me, but goes to this third person, which he also doesn't know who that person A paid forward game was conducted. Again, three players involved, all three randomly paired by, you know, by the computer, and the game is anonymous. But what you contribute is multiplied by two. For example, if you know at, at, at the beginning of the game, each player was given a hundred rupee, uh, uh, 10, ten tens, which means uh, 100 rupees in an envelope. So whatever I wanted to contribute, I put in the second envelope and you know the facilitator comes and collects it. But then whatever I've contributed is multiplied by two. And exactly the same way as I did. So whatever he contributes doesn't come back to me, but goes to measure individual pro-sociality. So this is an individual game. So this is the first behavior game. The second game is a standard public goods game where all 12 players were asked to contribute a certain, you know, any amount that they want, but whatever they contribute, 20% of the contribution is given to each individual player in that group. Again, there's 12 players. So if I contribute, out of 100 rupees, if I contribute, let's say 
10 rupees only, then two rupees is given to each of the 12 players. This is to measure group cohesiveness, right? Because mind you, you know, the optimal strategy distributing 20% of that, each individual, including I am going to receive it, right? So the optimal strategy here is to not contribute at all. Likewise, the optimal strategy here is to not contribute at all. So these are the two behavioral games which combined is our dependent variable. Again, if you'd like to know more about these games, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm, I'm more than happy to share the paper with you. So the research design we adopt is a multi-case research design. We use the, exactly the same games, exactly the same uh, method in three different countries, or, or countries, uh, you know, with three different contexts. Based on our feedback, we again replicated our Nepal research in Ivory Coast in the summer of 2015, and also in December 2015. And then again, we replicated our research in Iraq in 2016. And then we've been conducting qualitative interviews since 2017 till, you know, uh, last month, because again, we're very fortunate to receive an r, &R for this paper. So that's why the qualitative interviews have been, you know, carrying on till last month. So these are some of the photos in Ivory Coast with uh, the Bagbo militias known as JPP. These are with our research here in Nepal. We wanted to do it with the Nepal army and the Maoist uh, fighters. Uh, the Maoist fighters are greed, but the Nepal army at the last minute backed out, backed down. So that's why we could not, uh, we did not have a comparison, which we managed to do in Ivory Coast because we ca carried out the same games with the professional army. And in 2016, we took the opportunity to go to Iraqi Kurdistan and conduct the same behavioral games with the Peshmerga fighters. Okay, now I'd like to talk about uh, 20 more minutes. So I think it'll just be enough to talk about the results and the discussions. The first set of results is from, of course, Nepal. So what you see here, the figure you see here on the x-axis is the number of years served by an individual soldier. On the y-axis is the amount donated in both the games. So paid forward game and the public goods game, we combined it. And that's our, uh, what you see on the y-axis. So what you immediately notice is the more the years each individual serves, the more contribution in terms of monetary contributions that controlling for all other factors, our subjects give about six more rupees for each extra year they served in the Maoist insurgency, right? So uh, for example, a soldier who served 10 years gave on average an extra 60 rupees, nearly one third of the entire endowment, which, is, which was 200 rupees. So the more you served, the more soldiers were willing to contribute individually, paid forward game, and to the group also, right? So this is what we found uh, in Nepal amongst the Maoist. The cantonment sites across Nepal, five cantonment sites from Butwal, you know, uh, to Chitwan, to Japa. So we actually physically went and carried out 17 to 18 uh, games with the mouse fighters. This, the games were carried out, uh, carried out in 2012. These are the results. So what the results are saying is the more number of years you serve in the PLA, the more pro-social behavior you're showing. And we can say that because this is a behavioral measure because they're actually making monetary contributions, which otherwise they could have kept for themselves. But then when we came out with the results, when we presented it to different audiences, there were concerns. Understandably, there were you know, few concerns because is the effect peculiar to communist inculcation? As we all know, there's a lot of indoctrination involved you know, in 
which was involved in the Maoist movement. So is this peculiar to this communist uh, communist ideology? Contributions been weaker for state army oh, as hypothesis. Oh if, if I may uh, interrupt, I think you're breaking. Uh, so there, there's a lot of uh, uh, this, you know, disturbances. So if you could repeat um, that. I'm, I'm here. Sorry about my bad connection. Do, do, do you think I should? I can switch to. Uh, am I am I clear now? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, at the moment, you are. You are not. You are breaking. Yeah. Point. Please feel free to just interrupt if I'm not clear. Shibi, you could switch off your video, Dr. Kharkat, then your internet could be. Okay. okay. But please just jump in, right? Because uh, that's the last thing that should be happening. And then the second concern was, well, as hypothesized, do we see the contribution weaker? Do we see pro-sociality weaker than the insurgents in state armies or professional armies? And we weren't able to do that because the Nepal army backed out the last minute. Also, the other concern was, does the Maoist clandestine character make observing shirking harder, right? So in a way, you know, we're arguing that uh, this is uh, all because uh, pro-sociality is really the key here because they want to overcome this free riding, this shirking problem, but in the Maoist, because of the communist inculcation, is it something harder? Do people, do fighters, do cartels shirk less in uh, a communist movement? Also, lack of lootable resources. There was this concern, what if you know the movement has direct access to uh, lootable resources? The other concern was uh, replicability due to low statistical power. Mind you, we only had 200 plus subjects. And of course, external validity. Will this hold to other movement or to other uh, studies, to other cases, to other insurgent cases, to other militia cases. So in order to address this concern, these concerns, what we did was in the summer of 2015, we're fortunate enough to be granted permission to carry out the same research with the Ivorian military and with, you know, ex Bagbo uh, militias, JPP, uh, what we call them JPP. And we did exactly the same games, the two games, exactly the same set of questions. And uh, what I want to make uh, very clear is in terms of contributions, we used uh, CIFA, what is called CIFA. So one US dollar is 500 CIFA. So what you see here, if 1000 CIFA is uh, $2. So here we are fortunate to compare the Ivorian army and pro Bagbo militia, right? And immediately you see for army, which is this straight line, Despite the number of years served, which is represented in this x-axis, it's almost flat, right? In fact, it's slightly going down, it's negative. Which means, doesn't matter how many years you've served, the pro-social behavior is not observed as we observed with the Ivorian militias, which actually is a positive Bagbo JPP militia group, the more they contributed to the group and to an individual in the group. So this is exactly what we predicted in our initial hypothesis testing in Nepal. And this is what we also found in Ivory Coast. So if you look at the tables, what you see is army, which means the Ivorian army times years in movement, and even with the covariates, with all the controls, they're contributing less. So with five CFAs less than their militia counterparts. And the paper has a balanced tables across you know, the professional army and the militias. There's some uh, uh, variations, but then in terms of uh, served, in terms of the military experience, a lot of things, in a lot of uh, variables, there's there's quite a good balance. So these are results from Ivory Coast. And again, the results from Ivory Coast uh, validate our hypothesis because it represents for both the groups, the professional military as well as the militias. What we did was, you know, there was again, you know, a lot of pushback in the sense, well, but this holds in Africa, what about, you know, if it's a different context in the Middle East? So we are again, very fortunate uh, 
to have access to the Iraqi Kurdistan uh, groups, especially the Pash Pashmergas in 2016, just before the uh, ISIS movement, the Kurdistan movement against the ISIS started. So we took, uh, we, we took advantage of this opportunity and we went to Kurdistan to carry out the same behavioral set of games with the Iraqi Pashmerga, Pashmergas who were ready, uh, who were actually being trained to fight ISIS, right? But then what's interesting is these volunteers had, you know, there was a lot of heterogeneity amongst the volunteers, right? Because some were pretty old and uh, their military experiences uh, dated back from pre-Saddam days, you know, back in 80s, back in the 90s two very young fighters who are volunteers and very eager to fight the ISIS. So what we did in our sample was we had to, be, if, if you look at the entire sample, right, it's still positive. But then what we had to show our argument is that the professional army is less pro-social than the non-state armed groups, right? So what we did was we disaggregated our sample into three groups. One is pre-2003 because we do this because after 2003, Kurdistan in a way, you know, achieved this autonomous autonomy from proper Iraq. And the US, especially the Europeans were heavily involved in professionalizing the Kurdish uh, military. So that is why we strongly believe and we explain this in detail in our paper that the pre-2003 Kurdish Pashmergas and the post-2003 aren't the same. We categorize the post-2003 as professionals and the pre-2003 as more like non-state armed groups. And when we disaggregate our results, we clearly see this difference between pre and post. Uh, what's also, uh, what I should also make it very clear is here for Kurdistan, you know, we show bivariate relationship for joiners from the pre-2003, between 2003 and 13, and post-2013. And post Given that these periods cover different decades, it is obvious that age might co-found, you know, our confound thoughts controlling for years. That's one thing that I really want to make uh, very clear here. So what, are, what can be you know, alternative explanations, right? Because, because one, thing, one thing that might be happening is, you know, there might be, there might be people who stayed behind who are exhibiting more pro-social behavior than those people who have left. So there might be desertations, right? A lot of desertations happening. So deserters might have, you know, never exhibited this pro-social quality as opposed to this might have been a self-selection thing that those willing to stay no matter what might have naturally this inbuilt pro-social quality. So sort of there's this crowd in effect and this group who stayed behind are expressing more pro-social behavior. So the question here now is, is that happening? So in order to test that, what we did was we asked our subjects the desertation rate in their cohort and the killed in, you know, their KIAs, which means also killed in actions uh, in their cohort. And the killed in actions is equally important because is, is there a self-selection but from the risk taker side. So people who are expressing more pro-social behaviors are more risk takers. That's why they're giving out more money because you know, in, in, in practice, probably this also has to do with risk takers. So in order to address these two concerns, what we did was we asked our subjects questions about dissertations in their courts, questions about how many people were killed in their cohort. In their cohort means the initial time they joined, you know, these subjects are put into what we call squads, what we call platoons, what we call sections. 
So if you look at this left figure, a point say at say 1996 and zero represents corresponds to a respondent who joined in 96, 1996, and for, and for whom none of their original platoon mates deserted throughout the war. Right, so for this guy, so no one deserted. Values greater than zero means that some share desert, there, there was some share of desertion at some point during the war. So for this guy, you know, 40% of his platoon mates deserted. The right graph can also be interpreted similarly, but for accumulated killed in action rates. So what you can immediately see is there's no clear pattern here, which addresses the concern that it's neither the risk takers nor people who've stayed behind only are showing this pro-social behavior. So again, going back to our main argument to note and remember that we argued it's this indoctrination, it's this inculcation that these insurgent groups use in absence of resources, in absence of uh, monetary incentives, they revert to this inculcation. That's the argument we want to make. And because we do not see risk takers or we do not see people who stayed behind showing any patterns of pro-sociality, we can at least address these two concerns. Not only in Nepal, these two figures are from Nepal, these figures are from Ivory Coast, and these figures are from Iraqi Kurdistan. And what's neat is in Ivory Coast, we also tested the same for the professional army, and we also do not see any biasness, any self-selection in the professional army. There's also, there's also an alternative, alternative explanation, which you know, is on, on, on the lines that it is not inculcation, it is not indoctrination, but is it just simply joining earlier, right? Just because you joined earlier also means you've served longer. And then that is what's just making you give more. In order to address this, what we did was we asked both PLA soldiers and we looked at the year the war started in the subject's district, right? And we also did the same for almost 200 civilians, 100 plus civilians. We looked at the districts where the war initially started. So these here, the districts initially, are the districts that the war initially started. So if the subject is here, then it means he's probably from the far west to Rukum Rolpa or you know, districts such as Sinduli, where the war started much earlier than, let's say, you know, some of the Tarai districts where the war you know, uh, touched much later. What we find actually is the opposite, meaning Maoists who came from districts that where the war started earlier, don't show more pro-social behavior, right? So this in a way addresses the concern that those who previously joined are unwilling to fight for the movement. Uh, those who joined previously does not mean that they're showing more pro-social behavior and are more willing to fight for the movement, right? So that's one of the concerns that we had and we show this by comparing our PLA soldiers with our civilians. So these are some of I've shown you here is uh, on desertation, on kill, and on whether it's simply a function of, you know, coming from the districts, that's where the war started initially. So I'd like to wrap up because we're also coming uh, towards the end of my presentation. I'm all, almost nearing 40 minutes. So just to wrap up, we've not brought something new, but our evidence does suggest that non-state armed groups, meaning insurgent groups, invest heavily in pro-social norms to construct, to construct an organizational hardcore. And this is of course, you know, again, as argued, this is not something new, it's consistent with much of the work on pre-existing social ties 
and military cohesion, especially uh, work that has recently touched upon the subject by Costa and Khan. I'd like to end my presentation with two important implications. The first, of course, is more an academic or theoretical implication. The second is, of course, of policy uh, value. The first theoretical or academic implication is that we've addressed, we've argued and we've shown you with evidence from across three different unique contexts that social motivation can contribute to efficient organizational problem in any insurgencies. Again, why is this important? Because Blattman and Miguel have argued, have laid out this puzzle that rebel groups are large, self-sustaining indigenous organizations and societies where effective organizations are rare. That's why understanding the glue that holds them together should be a top research priority. And in some ways, to be very honest, no one has shown empirically as much as we did how it actually is, what this holding them together means. That's what we've tried to address uh, in terms of our theoretical contribution. In terms of policy, what we've shown is there's a difference between career versus cause, right? What I mean by that is our evidence, is, our evidence suggests that socialization, the evidence of socialization points to the importance of not only material, but also social rewards to induce non-state armed actors to reject non-state armed actors, non-state armed actor group participation, right? What I mean by this simply is, imagine that if you were to demobilize and try to reintegrate any insurgents from an ongoing insurgency problem, just isn't simply enough. What you also have to do is you have to try to socially entice that individual, try to give him sort of meaning to life, try to also give him some kind of importance that his group had given him. So as much as monetary incentives is important, we also argue that for policymakers, social enticement is equally important. Uh, thank you very much. So I'm happy to share my uh, paper with you if there's anyone who's interested. Uh, is it okay if I, yeah, okay. Dr. Acharya. Yes. Uh... Yeah, uh, absolutely. Now, now I, I would like to invite Dr. Piacarel to moderate the uh, Q&A session and to provide her own comments as well. So we already have, I'm sorry, we already have multiple questions. So what I'll do is I'll uh, start calling out uh, individuals that have already posted their questions. So, um, the first person is uh, Ramji, Mr. Ram Acharya. If you could go and uh, ask Dr. Kharga what you wanted to ask, and I'll come to others serially. So should I read his question and try to answer it? Uh, if, well, if you, uh, I think Ramji is right here. So if you could, Ramji, go ahead. Right. Yeah, so I, I, I got uh, Mr. Ram Acharya's question. This game was played only after 2007. It was actually played in 2012 when the Maoists were in their controlments. And then, we, we cannot hear you, Mr. Sorry, I, I, I was muted, okay. So um, it's a great paper. I think considering the, your background, it's, uh, it's inspiring uh, what you have been doing. I'm an economist. I do work on game theory. I find uh, the game very difficult to appreciate right now. I have to go through the paper, but I have a fundamental question. Uh, I don't know whether it is uh, related to your paper seems to me. If there are two things, for example, one is desperation. I remember in Nepali, uh, if, there is, if there is a desperation there and there is a political dogma or religious dogma, where fighting become the uh, dominant strategy, for them at least. 
think about the very poor people, think about the Maoist who has a political dogma, we can have a Switzerland tomorrow if we win the, this type of things. How do you incorporate those into this game? Because it's really very different uh, endowment effect. When you look the police who are working, army who are working from the government side, the reward for them is defined. Uh, in a way, the risk is defined, but for them, the risk is not known, the endowment is not known, or in, in some words, the endowment is so large, uh, by, uh, you know, the, uh, it might be elusive, but that's how they are fighting for I don't know whether you take this into consideration, uh, uh, matching those games. Right, uh, right, uh, Mr. Ramachari, thank you very much for your question. Just to answer you very quickly, that's the whole idea about the paper, because on indoctrination and indoctrination in turn built their social pro-social behavior which our games capture so that's the only thing that we actually want to show in the paper which is insurgent movements insert you know insurgents are inculcated such that they have to they they are they express more pro-social behavior that's the whole and the fundamental you know, uh, argument in the paper. But I do get your question. Okay. Uh, so should we move to the next question? Uh, Dr. Bora has got multiple questions. So now I will right. give it to you. So if Dr. Bora could come up uh, with, with his questions. Right. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Kirk, a uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, and I'm really impressed with the background we came through and the journey you took to get to this point, writing such a wonderful paper. Really congratulations. Uh, I have very quick uh, observation, three things. One is the, uh, uh, have you looked into the endowment effect, right? Like you gave them a 200 rupees. So I was wondering if uh, that, you know, if there's any endowment effect uh, you tried the other thing is, I'm assuming you are playing these games uh, over a round, right? Several rounds, right? This, this is a one-shot game, sir. It's a one-shot game. It's just it, one it shot. Have any, yes, it doesn't have any iterations. It's not a repeated game. It's not a repeated game. Never mind. Then, and uh, the finally, uh, one thing you speak of is the uh, willingness to fight or social motivation. And one of the things uh, I was curious to know from you, especially from Nepal's perspective, some of the research that you know, I myself have been involved in looked into the income inequality right. as the motivation for them to join, right? So uh, can you speak to these two? One is the endowment effect uh, in your game and the other one is the anything you can shed light on the income inequality as one of the factors. Right. I think uh, if I understand your question, the first question is whether the game is able to capture. Uh, Dr. Karka, you're breaking again. Uh, okay, I'll, 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 I'll quickly address. Thank you. Thank you. No worries, sir. I'll, I'll just go on. So, and, and, the, and then the second question about, I'm very aware, in fact, your paper is a great uh, motivation about the income, uh, the, the inequality. I think our paper actually, to some extent, links to your work in the sense we are aware of, you know, the social inequality. But the task that we've undertaken is how do you motivate soldiers to pick up arms? You know, I think this is a second step to what you've identified in your paper, the AJ, the famous AJPS paper. I think that's the first step. But how do you overcome the free riding challenge? How do you overcome the commitment problem? Of course, people argue that it's indoctrination, but what is the process? How does pro-sociality build over time in each individual soldier? That's what we've been trying to show in this paper using behavioral games. Should we go to the third question? Okay, uh, so, yes. Um, so the third question um, uh, was from Dr. Avidit Acharya. So let's have Dr. Acharya ask you the question. Yes, Dr. Acharya. Thank you. Um, so I posted my question before you uh, uh, presented your alternative explanations. And so some part of it was already covered uh, by your alternative explanations, but let me read it out anyway. Yeah. Uh, so I wrote, is it possible that investment by the rebel uh, or military leaders is not the driver of sociality, but rather there's a selection effect? 
Uh, so for to volunteer for fighting on behalf of the rebels, you have to be ideologically quite committed to the cause. And those who remain as fighters for many years are those who are more, more committed. If ideological commitment and pro-sociality go together, uh, then maybe some of this is a selection rather than investment by rebel leaders. So you, you did present some evidence against these hypotheses. But more broadly, I think that what's, what I felt was a little bit missing in the, in the talk was that uh, you didn't present any direct evidence that there was uh, effort on the part of the rebel leaders to generate this type of pro-sociality. I mean, you showed that it wasn't driven by some, some other factors, but what were they doing? And maybe this is where the qualitative work that you guys are, are doing yes. comes in. What are they doing to in, in, indoctrinate, to, to inculcate these, uh, the, this, this level of pro-sociality? So thank you very much for uh, identifying uh, the omission, which I you know, apologize for. In fact, the paper, there's a section in the paper all about inculcation, how the leaders spend you know, resources in terms of both human resources, meaning only choosing you know, people that can actually indoctrinate and also time. So our argument is exactly what you've identified in the sense leaders actually spend considerable resources, both in terms of money and right people in order to indoctrinate uh, fighters so that this sociality is built over time gradually. But there is a separate section in the paper that talks about this in great detail, Dr. Acharya. And I'm sorry for the omission in the paper. Thank you. No, in, in, in my presentation today. Okay, uh, should we move on to the next question? Yeah. Uh, so the next question is from Mr. Pankaj Koyala. So if you could please come forward with your question or, yes. Thank you. Thank you for this nice presentation, uh, Professor. My question is almost related to Professor Acharya. So partly he already asked the questions and partly you already answered the some question I want to repeat one more time. So, so there is a chance that that's uh, in the most incident people are like, yeah. So there is a chance that, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Would you want to complete your question? Please go ahead. I'm sorry I interrupted. Okay. So my question is, uh, I have written two questions. First one is that the are they are comparable group? So the Maoist, uh, Maoist and the army are, are, the, are they comparable to each other? Means they might be from the different population. Another one is, the question is whether the process of people might uh, join the more uh, Maoist insurgency, because as you, as Professor uh, Achari also told, they might, uh, themselves might be more altruistic or more processal, and they are more likely to choose Maoist insurgents. As a result, we get the higher effect as a, in a dependent variable, as you said in the paid forward reciprocity, right? So this is the, my question. My question, how you control the processality uh, or the social value orientation of individual? I think, I think we lost uh, Mr. Koirala, right? Or is it my end, Dr. Pyakurin? But uh, I think I understood his question. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, I, I yeah, think it's both maybe. I'll just jump in because I think there are a few other people. Okay, okay. Yeah. If, if, so if, I'm if, also, if, uh, I'm just, yeah. Yeah, if you don't I have mind, just uh, repeated the question, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I have just re repeated the question. So what is the question is, so whether uh, you did a so as you can control, see, if you did see you this, control, yeah. yeah. So, uh, Dr. Kharka, can you hear him? Yeah, I can hear uh, Mr. Koiral, but I was also trying to answer. Should I answer? Should I wait? Uh, let's let's hear uh, Mr. Koiral out and then uh, we'll Yeah, go. okay. Yeah. Mr. Please go ahead, Mr. Koiral. Hello. So my question is again, so uh, have you controlled the pro-sociality of individual? So as far as my understanding, we can identify the individual's pro-sociality pro pro using the different method. For example, Van Lange 2007 and Morphe have some kind of tools to identify their processality. So this can be controlled and then that we can see the effect of the, uh, whether joining to the uh, Maoist insurgency or the PLA have direct effect on the dependent variable or not. Here I see that probably some kind of processality uh, kind of things are 
uh, also um, created some kind of selection bias. So this is my question. Dr. Karka, can you, can you hear Mr. Koirala? I, I can hear Mr. Koirala. Okay. I, I clearly heard him. Okay. Should I, sure, should go I ahead. respond? Yes, yes, please. Yeah, very quickly, uh, Mr. Koirala, if you can see the uh, graph here on the screen, which uh, compares the professional army in Ivory Coast with the militias, which you know could be a substitute for the Maoists here. You can actually see beginning the beginning of the move. people who have only served one or two years. In fact, the pro the pro sociality in the professional army is much higher. But over time, it remains constant. But over time, the militias, or if we talk about the Maoist here, their pro sociality goes up, right? So that's mm. the whole argument of the paper that when they join, the pro social le level isn't mm. well. The pro-sociality is only really exploited towards the later phase, meaning the more you serve in the army or in the insurgency, the more pro-social you become. So yeah. that's the argument. I hope you, you I, I'm sorry if I'm not able to explain this well, but if there's soldier X in Maoist and soldier Y in NA, both, sir, both joined you know, the, you know, last week, then the argument in the paper is their pro-social level must be the same. But mm. over time, because of the indoctrination, the most pro-social level is slowly going to go up as opposed to the NA pro-social level, which will remain constant. And the reason why this is happening is because the NA has other incentives, material incentives, as opposed to the most who do not have that. That's the, you know, answer to your first question. The second answer, which you mentioned, did we use other measures to measure pro-sociality? We did not, unfortunately we did not. But will, will my answer address your concerns when I say that we only observe more pro-sociality in people who've served more, right? Mm. Because we see this heterogeneity, we see this variance between initial, between recent joiners and old joiners. I hope I was able to answer your question. I, I understand, I understand. So well, my, my concern is, yes. Yeah. Okay, we can talk later as well. But, okay. Thank you, thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you. Okay, so the next question we're going to go to is uh, from uh, Mr. Jagdish. So Jagdish Ji, if you could uh, come forward with your question, please. Or if you want me to read it, that's fine too. Uh, I, I can I, actually read it. Yes, you. yes uh, sir. There are two points actually. This is very good presentation, very nicely uh, done research. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, some of the findings, of course, uh, uh, depending on uh, the uh, uh, points that you have picked up and shared, uh, might have been uh, you know more uh, enlightening. Uh, one thing, uh, the the entrapment effect uh, is very powerful uh, uh, in these games, uh, be it uh, gambling or be it war. Once you are in a group. Uh, it's very difficult for you to quit because the implications are very serious. One threat, uh, even more than that, it is uh, you just feel like you have committed so much that you would like to commit more. So it's a kind of playing games. I mean, you keep on adding. So that's one part, I don't know uh, to what extent in your research it was factored in. Uh, and the other part is we are assuming that the there was a freedom to choose, okay? A ah, little bit. But initial entry to these groups is very important to consider, I think, how they were. Because most of the young, um, young fighters uh, in the Maoist movement were actually, they were captured from the school, uh, coerced initially, and then indoctrinated. So that factor is very important so that we don't miss out and we don't assume that they were free to choose. So when you are playing games, uh, those games, and then real situation where the, you are coerced, it makes a big difference, I think. Of course, it will have implication for the uh, sociability of the person. That's what I was thinking. Right. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much for your question. I understand your concern, and I think uh, this is one of the uh, methodological contribution we are trying to make to this broader question, which you've correctly identified, because it's such a big challenge. How do you address, how do you 
you know, uh, come up with findings that can address ex excellent questions which you've identified. And again, we understand that there was a lot of coercion. There was a lot of, you know, forced recruitment. A lot of young children were 14, 15, 16, you know, children uh, of, of that age category were recruited forcefully. But again, what we're trying to show here is the Maoists or the Bagbo militias or the Peshmer guys in Iraq, they have to rely on indoctrination, which we argue in the paper as inculcation to build this pro-sociality. And the reason they have to do that is only that will allow these fighters to make this voluntary contribution in terms of fighting and not a shirt while making this contribution, contribution to this organizational cause. That's, I think, what we're trying to show here using behavioral games, which we did not find having the same effects neither in the professional Peshmerga army nor in the professional Bagbo, not Bagbo, sorry, Ivorian military. So that's one of the many possible contributions that other research also could possibly make, sir. But I think our contribution is using behavioral games to show the process. That is, I think, what I think we need to be very clear of. But I understand your concerns because this, this honestly, insurgency is one of the biggest puzzles in political science. So I do understand your concerns. Thank you. Very good. Uh, so uh, the next uh, question, I don't know if this is a question or a comment, but uh, it's from Chidamani Kaneji. Uh, and what he writes is lack of balanced distribution of resources and development activities also. So I don't know if it's a question or a comment, but yes. if Chidamaniji is here. Uh, if you want to ask Dr. Karka anything, please go ahead. Uh, well, it looks like he's not here. Because yeah, there just, no, that, no I'm sorry, I'm sorry, go ahead, my, my bad, sorry, go ahead. That's why Churamani, you've identified the reason why, what motivated us for this research, and which is the, exactly, you know, the, uh, the argument that you made, lack of resources and all that, that's why these groups use indoctrination, use, you know, inculcation to build, you know, pro-social traits, which we've provided evidence using behavioral games. Thank you, Dr. Okay, uh, so the next question is from Yamunaji. Um, uh, Yamunaji, do you want to ask Dr. Karka? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Karka. It's very, very interesting topic for me. It's, it's very uh, high level <laughs> uh, research and discussion. For me, only the thing is in case of Nepal, we had lots of uh, issues related with uh, class, caste, and ethnicity who had been uh, joining Maoist movement, but later on when they are uh, in, the, in the public and uh, the majority of them were not been able to get space into the formal system. So I'm just trying to understand, does the caste, ethnicity, and gender is also a factor you have looked into this process? Absolutely, absolutely, Ms. Ghale. In fact, you know, I, I want you to understand this as a dynamic process, right? Imagine that there's a lot of inequality in terms of caste in a particular district. And let's say, you know, a Maoist leader of, you know, a, a very high caliber leader's function is to go and recruit people and to build this organization from grassroots level in this new district. So what he's going to do is, according to our paper, right? According to our paper, according to our argument, this is a dynamic process. He's going to go and indoctrinate these young volunteers using some kind of element related to what you just said, caste, ethnicity. So what we've shown in the paper is the Maoist leadership will use this, but then this over time is going to build this pro-social traits from these volunteers. That's what we've shown. So let's say indoctrination can happen using caste, using in income inequality, like Professor Bora's research has identified, but building this pro-social norms, this willingness to fight is a dynamic process. That's what the research is about. That only happens over time. It doesn't have happen overnight. And that is what we call indoctrination. That is what these volunteers build so that they take up arms and fight voluntarily without any promises of future reward. That's the research. 
So I'm just trying to connect with, you know, what you've identified with what the paper is about. Um, thank you, Dr. Pratap. So the next question is from Kedar Nupaniji. Um, Kedarji, are you are you here? Do you want to ask yes. questions? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, I, uh, my question is not exactly a question, it's a comment and then the question in the end because everybody talks about the Maoist movement and your paper uh, has given evidence or at least suggestion in the Côte d'Ivoire and Pasmargar and you said in Iraq, I said, I, I believe that. But then what you, I didn't see in that, why this uh, pro-social homogeneity came about the context and environment when this uh, insurgency began. Uh, when I look at the literacy rate among Kurdistan, you know, I, I have worked in the Iraq also, so I know that reason very well, uh, and very poor. But their orientation was to create a nation is good. So it's not exactly like the Maoist movement in Nepal who wanted to overthrow the regime and create a communist regime kind of a thing, which is just it's a different kind of a philosophy. And exactly when I look at the Cote d'Ivoire, it's again, it's a different context. Uh, the population all are, in my view, either in Nepal or Pasmargar or in Cote d'Ivoire, their literacy rate is very low. And, but the orientation were very different to get organized. So social capital is completely different. And when you use the game theory to explain this behavior, obviously behavior is influenced by your education level, your environment, your social context also. And I don't know how much it played in your analysis. And that's for one, my curiosity. And I did that question now to pose you because when I look at other popular, uh, the movement in the world, I uh, starting from the Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka, they were highly educated, well-informed, and they were also looking for a nation state. And if you go back even further now, say 70s, then you go to Palestinian movement. They are also highly educated. They were talking about nation state. Again, in the, now when we come to East Africa, I guess you have experience. When you were in Ethiopia also, when TPLF took power in Addis Ababa, they were also on the nation state and in the group diversity issue came up. Again, just like in Nepal, more or less, as we see now, we have a federalism in Ethiopia is the same. So did you ever look at that context or did you think, I know it may not be relevant because your research is only to, looks like uh, focused in the uh, uh, Did you look at that social context environment in your analysis behavior? That's my question, thank you. Right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kiran Nopane. I think uh, what you've identified is to some extent, maybe I wasn't able to explain it well in, the, in, in my presentation, but is actually on your argument, on the lines of you know, the arguments you just made in the sense, this is not just to do with communist ideology or you know, ethnic ideology in Ivory Coast, or let's say this religion sectarian divide in Kurdistan. It is to do with in groups that do not have enough material incentives or, do not have this credible commitment factor. What do they use as a substitute? They use indoctrination and then they use it effectively to build pro-social traits within you know, their volunteers. That's the argument. And I'd like to take our example to what you know, happened in the first week of January in the United States, right? You could see there were these different you know, groups, but all convened in you know, DC, Washington DC and stormed the Capitol. I'm sure there was no, you know, material incentives or there was no credible, you know, rewards. They, they did that because they're ideologically motivated. And probably that is what I really want, you know, the audience to understand that that doesn't happen overnight. It's built over time, but then that is the substitute that is needed to drive an organization, right? That's the whole argument of the paper. No, I, I, this I, I think social really behavior. Fun this willingness to sacrifice for a cause. Nothing new, again, don't get me wrong, this is nothing new. We're not trying to come up with a new theory, but we have provided systematic evidence from no, three different points. I, I think I understand. I think uh, that's that's because of the crunch of time, we just have five minutes and we have two more questions. So okay. let me right. go, I'm so sorry, All I apologize. All right, no problem. So, uh, yes. Let's quickly move on to the two uh, next two questions. Uh, and, and let me just read it out to you because we don't have time. One's from Kirti Subhidiji and uh, another is from Prista Ratan, Ratanapra. 
so KTG says, does, um, so she asks, does this incentive differ from social protection? And uh, Pristaji uh, writes, uh, you had mentioned we can use social rewards or social enticement uh, to induce S NSAG to reject participation. Do you think this can reverse uh, or change the ideological commitment? So if you could quickly answer to those questions. Please. Okay, first uh, I'd like to answer what uh, Kritiji has uh, you know, identified. She's asked, does this incentive differ from social protection? I, I don't know your definition of social protection here, so I apologize, my apologies, but this is social incentives. It is, you know, intrinsic. It, it's not extrinsic incentives such as monetary rewards or promotions or what the professional armies use such as medals. This is something that you cannot see. It is this endowment, this utility, that glow, right? That's what we're trying to argue here. So maybe social protection might also substitute on the lines of what I just said. So if you could define social protection, maybe I would have a better answer, but I hope I was able to answer. The second question, I did not get the second question correctly, uh, Dr. Piakure. Uh So she, she writes, we can use yeah. social rewards or social enticement to induce uh, NSAG to reject participation. Do you think right. this can reverse or change the ideological commitment? Um, right, I, now I understand. I think that's why the focus currently in all uh, reintegration projects across the world, especially looking at Islamic context, conflicts today, uh -huh. you know, puts a lot of emphasis on de-radicalization, right? So it's not just job creation projects, but then there's this social cycle support where people try to, these imams come in and try to de-radicalize this fighter. So I think that's a very important point you make and I hope I was able to. Okay. Thank you so much. So it's already 6.58 and yeah. uh, you know, um, let me be a little selfish here, just because, uh, if I may, uh, Dr. Ajayde, can I? Because I'm also a student of the subject. I have one, and I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, it's, um, I guess, way too important for me. So, if I could uh, please yeah, ask. Uh, so, uh, I, I read your paper. It's extremely interesting. Very well written. Uh, very, very pertinent. Very relevant for me. Uh, there's, there was one. Um, paragraph or one statement in page five, on page five, I'm sorry, uh, where you wrote that Cohen argues some groups uh, have used rape to create these social bonds. So, you know, I was uh, just like, you know, I wondered as to how and why. So if you could. Uh, That's, if I, if I may quickly answer a question, that is happening a lot in Eastern DRC actually. Uh -huh. So the reason that the reason, you know, this is happening is because I think that's a substitute for lootable resources in the sense, you know, when these young 17, 18 year olds are allowed to pillage, not just in terms of, you know, uh, resources, lootable resources, but also rape and pillage, then that actually gives them this sort of unfortunate, but this is reward, this glow, you know, to contribute to the cause. So it's, it is happening. And it is, uh, I think, something that we've mentioned is that is that does that yes, answer your question? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you but so much. I can I can because you're Dr. Packard, because you're interested in gender studies, I can send you a few excellent papers. Yes, that that would be so great. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Acharya. Wonderful presentation, a very good paper. Thank you so much. I feel honored to you know to be here. Um, no, thank you so much, Dr. Acharya. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, and Dr. Piakurel. Okay, thank you. Over to you, Dr. All right, thank you. So since since we're just about uh uh at the end, 6.15 here in uh, California. Um, let me not give a long-winded closing statement, but let me just simply close by saying thank you to Dr. Karta for presenting and to Dr. Piacarel for moderating what was a stimulating talk on an important topic. And thanks everyone for coming and we'll see you next time. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.